Todd Kerr. I'm the Minister of Education here at First Baptist. And first of all, I want to thank all the people that have uh, done uh, the lessons until now. The nice thing is I'm, uh, I've got uh, Romans chapter 12, and everything they have really taught up to this point leads up to really the verses I'm going to talk about today. So I uh, thank you so much for joining. I will try to make sure that this is a lesson that you're going to remember for a long time. Not because I'm going to say anything special, but just because of what Paul says in this letter. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions before we begin. And I want you to think about this. Here's the question. What do you want out of your life? What kind of things uh, do you need in your life? And if you want to stop the tape, let's go ahead and stop it right now because I really want you to think about what do you want for your life? If you've had time to think a little bit about that or maybe you've had time to think before, to get into the lesson today, let me read a little bit from Romans chapter 11 to remind you a little bit about what we've done so far. Here is what Romans 11 verse 33 to the end of the chapter really says. Oh, the depth of the riches, riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. And then he quotes from the Old Testament. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become His counselor? Or who has first given to Him? And it shall be repaid to Him. For of Him, that's God, and through Him, God, and to Him, God, are all things to whom be glory forever and ever, every day, throughout now and all eternity. And then He says those words, Amen. Let me remind you of the question I asked you before I read that passage. What do you want out of life? I was doing some counseling in another state uh, some years ago. And a young woman came in and said, I really am having a hard time. I can't seem to get this Christian life down right. It is not at all what I want it to be. I have no sense of accomplishment. I'm continually uh, defeated. I've got no victory. I've tried. I'm not pleased with where my Christian life is going. Now, I have done everything. I've attended Bible studies. I've gone to worship. I've sung in the choir, I've done all sorts of volunteer work, I've been in small groups, I've been in large groups, I have done everything I can think of. And then she asked the question, which was really not a question but a statement, but I heard a question in her mind. I just want all of what God has to offer. I want all of what God has to give. What's the secret of a full and meaningful life? The abundant life. Life with a capital L. Life out loud as some people call it. That's really the subject of Romans chapter 12. And I'll tell you a secret. We're going to find out that that woman and most of us really asked the wrong question. Now let's recap what we've talked about over the last several weeks. In fact, over the last several weeks that we've talked about well, starting back at the first of March, when we started studying the book of Romans. Before the coronavirus, before the stay-at-home directives, before mask and social differences, way before we talked about reopening of our community and America and our church. In chapters 1 through 11 of Romans, Paul begins by doing something that he does in several books in the Bible. Now, in Galatians chapters 1 through 4, he tells us uh, everything that God has done for His people. And then in chapter 5, you'll see this word, therefore. Now, Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 does the same kind of thing. He'll tell everything, Paul in Ephesians will tell everything that God has done for the believer. And then in chapter 4, guess what he says? Therefore. Colossians chapters 1 and 2, the same pattern. What he'll talk about in the first two chapters is everything that God has done for the family, for his family, for his children, all the blessings that we can have. And then in chapter 3, verse 5, he says that very same word, therefore. 
And then in 1 Thessalonians chapters 1 and 2, he does the same kind of thing. Here are all the blessings of the believers, the gifts of the family, everything that God has already given you, despite what you have done and what you have been. These are free gifts. And then in chapter 3, Paul says this, Therefore. Now, maybe the answer to that young woman's question and maybe the answer to your question is in that word, therefore. Now, why does the Apostle Paul do that? Why does he list over and over again in book after book? Uh, his books take up two-thirds of the New Testament. And in book after book, he does that same pattern. In fact, in Romans 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11, he will list 20 gifts that God has already bestowed on us, his family. Things out of his love that he gives us, not because we deserve it, but merely because he loves us. He loves us as his children. He loves us as his family. He wants the best for us. So he gives us these gifts. Now let me go ahead and tell you what we're going to hear. Paul's going to say, this is the secret to the victorious Christian life. It's the same answer that he gave the rich young ruler. Remember the story? The rich young ruler says, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That means to me, what must I do to get the big life? To understand what life is all about. And remember what Jesus said? Well, you know the commandments. And He said, all those things I have done <coughs> for my youth. Which is sort of reminiscent of what that young woman told me that day in counseling. All the things I was supposed to do, I've done. Maybe you feel like that too. You've done everything. You've been to every uh, service. You've attended every Bible study you can. You read the Word. You give. You tithe. All that sort of thing. He gives the answer in Romans chapter 12 when He says, Therefore, maybe not so much in words, but that's the turning of the book of Romans in chapter 12. All we have to do is have the courage to ask now let me read you a little bit out of Romans chapter 12. You don't see it, by the way, but I have a very colorful Bible here. It's a counseling Bible that I use in counseling. A lot of times people need uh, encouragement. They need the Word of God because we hear uh, as early as our vacation Bible school memory verse, Thy word I have hidden my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So I've got those passages marked in blue so I can find it very easy. But here's the words, it's the same word that you see in your Bible. It's the same word that we have in, in all Bibles. With a little different depending on the translation. Here's what my Bible says, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable... Now this is where it's different. In some Bibles it says the word worship. In some Bibles it says the word service. Interestingly enough, in Koine Greek, the language that the New Testament was written in, that word can mean both things. And then it says in verse 2, And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable as far as the perfect will of God. Now, wait a minute. Remember what that young woman asked me? I just want to have all that God has to give. Maybe it's not so much about asking for more from God maybe we need to start asking God what do you want from us Paul spent the first 11 chapters of this tremendous book Romans is probably his best writing his highest writing his most insightful intellectual inspiring and transforming book in the New Testament it's right here in Romans as we found out maybe it's not so much about how much more God can give us but how much more we can give God. That's the secret that he's going to talk about here. Maybe we need to give more to God. And so Paul turns that question around, that young woman asked, and the question that we ask, how do we get more of God? 
The way we get more of God is give more to God. Now, I know what you're going to say. Uh, how Now, I'm asking for something here, and you're telling me that you need more from me? That uh, you want more from me? My life is full of asking, of people asking from me. I've got, uh, am I not giving enough? Even here at church, I go to the worship services, I attend Bible studies, I tithe, I give my offering, I volunteer for special projects. How much more time is this going to cost me? Now that's just here in church, that's just a part of your life. Can you imagine uh, everything else a person can do? Their community involvement, their school involvement, their work involvement. And here somebody says, but that's not enough. You need to give more. But remember that woman's question. I want to be able to answer questions like that for you and that woman. Do you remember? Have you thought about what you want people to say about you after you're gone? How do you want to be remembered? What kind of life and legacy do you want to live? I want you to think about that a little bit. Again, stop the tape if you need to do that and figure out what do I really want to leave this in this life? What, I want, what do I want people to remember me for? Uh, I have an exercise sometimes where I get people to write their own obituary and live their selves backwards from that obituary. Here's my goal and what kind of life do I have to live to have that said about me? Now, Paul is answering that question and here's the secret. He, in this passage, talks about four centers of intelligence, four things that we have in our life that make up our life. He talks about what the soul does, the body, the mind, and the heart or the will. Now remember Jesus' words when the Pharisee comes up and says, um, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or what must I do to uh, have a meaningful life? And he says, uh, he says, well, what do you think? What do you read? And the Pharisee says this. And it comes, uh, this comes from Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And then he says, by the way, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He says in that passage, we love God with all our... Well, the Hebrew word is isness. Everything that makes you, you, your mind, your will, your heart, your strength, everything that you have, love God with everything. <clears throat> and then he says, notice how he starts this passage, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters. Now, beseech is not a word that we use a whole lot. Beseech is an interesting word in the mouth of Paul because... Paul was probably one of the most learned men uh, in his day. He was taught by Gamaliel, one of the uh, uh, most important rabbis of his day. He was both a Jewish citizen and a Roman citizen. He could travel all over the world. He had the best of education. He had every right to say, you must do this. But he uses this word, beseech. Now in the original Greek, that word means to beg, to plead to say, please, please do this for your own good. I beseech you. And then he says, brothers and sisters. Your Bibles may say, men. But when, when God calls people, He calls men and women. There's a different spirituality for sure. But they're equal spiritualities, men and women. He says, he says I beseech you, brothers and sisters. In Jesus' world, uh, the ground is level at the foot of the cross for men and women, Greek and Jews, for all of us, saint and sinner. God calls us all to be part of His family. He says, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, first of all, I want you to know that you're not alone. What a word for us to hear these days. We are not alone. We're part of a family that has lasted from before we know it, and if God tarries, will last long beyond that we're here. We are not alone. God calls us personally, but He doesn't call us to stay separate. He says, I want you to be part of my family. You belong in part of the family. God wants you to come along, come along beside you. Um, 
He talks about later on and earlier on about the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for that is paraclete. It means one who travels beside you. Jesus says, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, those of you who have experienced the power, the mighty acts of God, who have heard it, who have seen it, who have witnessed it, who have felt it, even as early as reading this letter in the Church of Rome, I talk to you as disciples, as people who have heard and have understood, who have said the words, who have sung the songs, brothers and sisters, I beseech you. And then he says, um, I, I remind you in 2 Corinthians ch uh, chapter 8, verse 3, he's talking about later on the poor churches in Macedonia. And he says, in great trial and affliction, you see the abundance of their joy. Even when we are afflicted, you see the joy, the abundance of their joy. And he says, even in their deep poverty, they abound in the riches of their liberality. He says, if you want to live a good life, life, the eternal life, the abundant life, you act like these people. Even when you're poor, you're rich. When you don't have any way out, He is the way out. When you're weak and don't have any strength left, He is your strength. He says in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I bear witness, I first I know have that first-hand knowledge, that according to their ability, and He says almost, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely and willingly able to give. But first, He says, and this is a word that he repeats in Romans chapter 12. First, he says, they gave themselves to God. That was their first duty. You can't give yourself to another unless you first give yourself to God. And he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, now, what are these mercies of God? Now, here are some. And again, he spent the first 11 chapters talking about all of God's mercies, all of His gifts. I made a list here, and I'm going to read from that list so I won't miss any. First of all, His love in Romans chapter 5. His grace. His Holy Spirit in Romans chapters 5 and 8. His peace. Remember when He said, My peace I give you, not as the world gives you, give I unto you in John 14. In Romans 1 and 8, he repeats that. Faith, over 20 times in the book of Romans, Paul mentions the gift of faith. Then he mentions comfort. He mentions the gift of God's power. Now, I'll remind you that God's power, the word in Greek for power, uh, is dynamos. It's the same word we get dynamite from. It's that explosive power that moves the rocks out in front of the tomb of Jesus. It's that explosive power that bursts through the gates of hell. It's that explosive power, power that's available to you and I if we are courageous enough and believing enough to accept it. We also have His hope, His patience, His kindness, His glory, His honor, His forgiveness, His justification, His security, His freedom. Remember, if Christ sets you free, you are free indeed. And then in Romans chapter 8, He says, you also have the benefit of being a son of God or a daughter of God. I list all these things out, and He gives us these things. We don't have to do anything. A gift is not something that you get because you deserve it many times. It's a gift that you give, uh, that you get and you receive because somebody loves you. We're not who we are. We're not special because God sees us as special. His love makes us special. His love makes us deserving. And then He says, um, then present your bodies. He goes from the soul. He talks about beseeching, brother, by the mercies of God. Well, that speaks to our soul. And now he's going to our body. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, this is strange language. It's actually temple language out of the book of Leviticus and some other places. He talks about sacrifices. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, you remember that in the early chapters of Leviticus, we hear a lot about the sacrifices and what they're used for. There's a hundred different kinds of sacrifices, birds, animals. Um, but the one thing you notice about those sacrifices is they are dead sacrifices. 
and after they're dead, you only die one time. They're offered, they're burned up to God, and then you have to come back and make that sacrifice again in another year. You have to bring another animal and things like that to the temple. Here he says, bring your bodies as a living sacrifice. He talks about the body because the body sometimes is uh, where sin is held. Even though we have a redeemed soul, sometimes our bodies don't allow that redemption to live out. Sin resides in our bodies, the Bible says, but it doesn't have to reign there. Thessalonians says, possess the vessel. Our bodies are a vessel of the Holy Spirit. For many of us, the soul is redeemed, but the body still has a bent for sin. 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says, I keep my body, Paul, under control and make it my slave so I won't lose out after telling the good news to somebody you don't want to do something that would take your witness to, away now it's interesting that he talks to the Romans the Romans and the Greeks uh, spent a lot of time on the body he says um, and Roman and the Greeks believe that they, uh, they lived in a duality the body was bad and the soul is good not so in the kingdom of Jesus. He says, I came to redeem both body and soul. And then he says, again, that living sacrifice. <clears throat> he says, offer a sacrifice, but you'll have to do it every moment. You make that a living sacrifice, an every day, an every moment sacrifice. You put yourself on the altar every moment of every day. That's what a living sacrifice is all about. Do you remember the story of Abraham in chapter 22 of Genesis where he was asked to sacrifice his beloved son, the son of the promise, the son of the covenant, the son that was going to keep the promises that God has given him going on forever and ever and ever. And then God came back and said, by the way, the one I promised you, your golden child, your precious son, your only son, the one I promised you, the one I gave you in old life, I'm going to ask for him back. He did that to test Abraham's faith. Do you love me, he said, for my blessings, or can you love me for just who I am? Now, that's not something that every Christian can answer. That is a high call, a holy call, a desperate call, a, dis a distinctive call. I think it's a call that more people have than we know. Abraham, you remember the story, you remember the scene where he was almost ready to sacrifice his only son. He even had his son carry the, 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 the twigs and the branches on his back to make the fire. And he was really ready to almost take that stone knife and kill his son. And God stop his hand. You don't have to do that. You've proven what you're made of. You'd be willing to sacrifice anything for me. That's what God wants to hear. And, and uh, Abraham said, I will spend the rest of my life without any of your blessings. I just want you. Not every Christian's ready for this. We want Christ, but we want Him sometimes more for His blessing than His presence. We all say, I'll die for Christ, but will you live for Him? Robin and I used to teach a lot up at Ridgecrest, and we taught couples. I remember there was a room of about 400 couples. We were talking about passion, uh, physical intimacy, if you will. And uh, we were talking to, to a, a group of men, and a group of women. Robin was leading them. And I said, boys, how many of you would die for your wife? Everybody raised their hand. Yes, I'll die for my wife. I said, you take a bullet for your wife. Yes, I'd push her out of the way. What if a train or a car was coming? Yes, I'd push her out of the way and I'd die for her. Boys, would you live for her? Would you listen to her when she wants to talk? Would you put your agenda aside and be with her without having to solve her problems? One guy in the back of the room raised his hand and says, give me the bullet. <laughs> Sad but true. He was willing to die for his wife, but he wasn't really willing to live for his wife. Christ has the same thing. I know you're willing to die for me. You die for me, 
in many ways, but are you willing to die once for all? Shakespeare wrote a, a play called The Valiant, and I remember when I was very young, I saw this play, <clears throat> and I remember a line, the valiant, uh, the coward dies a thousand deaths, the valiant only once. Is in light of God's mercy, all those things that He's given us, and He tells us about in chapters 1 through 11, He says, I want to ask you something. In light of all those things, am I asking for a sacrifice or am I offering you a privilege? And then He says, this sacrifice is going to be holy and acceptable to God which is your reasonable worship. Now, that word holy has become to mean something else other than classical, in classical Greek. Classical Greek, by the way, is different from the Koine Greek. Classical Greek, Greek was spoken by everybody uh, uh, in Greece and it was, was uh, seen uh, as the language. Uh, if you were a proper Grecian person, you would know classical Greek. Hagios is the word they use for holy. Now, that word hagios does not mean pure and uh, and and set apart and uh, and sinless it just means it's set apart the uh, old testament word for set apart is the same word for pharisee by the way it's the root word for pharisee those who have been set apart jesus is saying and paul is saying I don't want you to be sinless. You don't have to wait until you're sinless to offer your body for Christ. I want you to be able to give it no matter what you have to give. Saint, sinner, a mixture of purity and stain. We all are that. He just wants us to do it, have the courage to present our bodies. Hagios. Are we half-hearted Christians? Do we flirt with our faith? Do we give just a little bit better of ourselves and hold some of us back because I know how we are, we Americans especially. Nobody will tell us what to do. We bow to nobody. Uh, authority is a tough word for us to handle. But he says here, are you willing to go all in for Jesus? And again, he's answering the question, do you want to have a full and meaningful life? He's not putting these requirements on us. He's saying this is how to get what you really want. Your heart's desire really is. And then in verse 2, he goes on and says, And by the way, don't be conformed by the renewing uh, to this world, but be transformed to the renewing by the renewing of your mind. He talked about the body. He started talking about the soul. He's talked about the body, and now he talks about the mind. Why does Paul spend so much time at the first of his books teaching about what God has given us? Why does he spend t so much time on what might be considered doctrine? I know in the Baptist church, I hear all the time, teach us something practical. Don't spend so much time on doctrine. Well, let me tell you how Paul writes. He knows that you have to know the truth before you live out the behavior. The duty always follows the doctrine. Ethics come out of dogma. He knows that we have to understand before we can live something out. And he also knows that the way we think is the way we live things out. So he begins to talk a little bit about what we have in mind and what we know. <clears throat> so. He's talked about those three things, and the next thing he's going to talk about is bringing us all together. All right, so far we've got the mind, the soul, the body, and now the will. And here's what the Bible says, so that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You have the soul that is grateful for the gifts of God. You have the mind that's saturated with the Word of God. You have the body that's full and available to God. And now the will that's obedient to the ways of God. Now let me remind you of the question because that's the most important part of this lesson. What do you want out of life? What are you hungry for in life? Let me give you another way to say that. What is the deepest hunger in your heart?
I want to talk about Sunday school. I don't want to talk about the church. I want to talk about you and your life and what's deep inside your life and what you really want out of life because that's where the Bible hits me and that's where I hope the Bible hits you. Now quickly, let me go to the last part in the last few minutes here. Um, when the Bible talks about in verses 3 through um, 21, I may not read it all because I'm going to let you read it because you may not believe it if I tell you. Here's what verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me, this is Paul talking, that everyone who is among you don't think of himself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly as God has dealt with each one a measure of their faith. We talk a lot about Christian humility. Now let me remind you what C.S. Lewis said about humility. C.S. Lewis wrote that um, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. And then he begins to talk about here's why we think humbly and soberly about ourselves. Don't think too less of yourself and don't take, think too much of yourself. Think that you fit in, that you're special, but everybody's special. I've got a sweatshirt that says, God loves you on the front. On the back it says, but God loves everybody. He really does. For we have as many members in one body, but all our members don't have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing, there's a book by that title, Gifts Differing. According to the grace that is given to us, let us use those gifts. After God has given us so much, it's only right. It's only out of a heart of thanksgiving that he asked for these things. He says, if, uh, if prophecy, if you're given the gift of prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, there's two kinds of prophecy mentioned in the Bible. There is foretelling. That's when the prophets look forward to the ages to come and tell about what the future holds, how God is going to work into the future. Now, that's a very important kind of prophecy. That's not the only kind of prophecy. There's another kind of prophecy that's more forth telling. That's looking around at the world and seeing what God is doing now. I must tell you during this time of the coronavirus that's what a lot of my friends are doing. What is God doing through all of this? I remember not too long ago I was on a, uh, a Zoom meeting with about 75 counselors, healers, spiritualists from all over the world. And the question, the title of that uh, webinar that Zoom meeting was the pandemic as a spiritual path. Now, I tuned in just because of the intriguing title, but it talked about how we might use this time to find out what God really was requiring us, to bring us back to Himself. I believe, and I know there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of suffering, there will be a lot of pain and a lot more suffering, but I hope we take that opportunity to hear what God is saying even in the difficult times. Because you and I both know that it's not in the good times that we learn the most. It's in the desperate times that we come closer to God. So prophesying is a gift that God gives us. Uh, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Let us minister as Christ ministered to us. He who teaches in his teaching teach with great deal of passion this bible should always be read with a great deal of passion this is the word of life this is god's word to us if we believe that this is inspired word of god in any way that we define that word inspired we should not allow this word to sit on this paper this word needs to come alive in our life he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy, show mercy with cheerfulness. Let us love without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to that which is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. You know, the Bible mentions three kinds of love in the Old Testament and three different kinds of love in the New Testament. You know about uh, actually four in the New Testament. There's eros love, there's filio love, 
There's storge love, this faithful love, and then there's agape love. He's talking here about the filios love. Love one another as brothers and sisters. You know, the people around you, they may be your husband or your wife or your uncle or your aunt or your parents or your children, uh, but they're all brothers and sisters. And so treat them like you would your brothers and sisters or like you would like to be treated by your brothers and sisters. And then it says in verse 10, uh, in honor of giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer, and distributing to the needs of the saints. And then he says uh, the second word. Humility is one of my important words. There's seven words that start with an H that are the center of my value system. Hospitality is the second word. Give with hospitality. Humility is the first word. It's the queen of all virtues. But I believe a close second is hospitality. That's the root word, by the way, for hospital, for hospice. It's caring for the needs, no matter what the needs are, of another. That doesn't mean saying yes all the time. Sometimes, as Jesus did, that means we say no to somebody for the glory of God and so that other person can grow. We answer other people like God answers us. Yes, sometimes, or wait, or no, because I've got something better for you. Now, here in this, uh, this passage, we see that he lists more than 20 or so gifts. But we're, we read in verses 3 through 21 uh, a list of other gifts that the believer has, that we as members of God's family has. Now let me tell you something about this list, the way I counted it. Uh, there is something in the Bible about the numbers, and you probably know that. Three is a symbol of the uh, Trinity. Four is the directions of the compass, north, south, east, and west. That's everywhere. Seven days uh, are the days of creation. Seven is a perfect number. That's why the number of man is six, because the number of God is seven. We are that close to God. The psalmist says, um, uh, "Why? what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you even think about him? And yet God loves you a little lower than, your Bible probably says angels, but that's not exactly what the psalmist says in Hebrew. It's a little bit lower than God Himself. God is seven. He's perfection. And we're six right down here. But also, twelve. Remember the twelve tribes in the Old Testament and the twelve disciples in the New Testament? Here He gives twelve things, twelve gifts to us to allow us to live the abundant life. And He lists them. And I just want to read this because I don't want to leave any of them out. He said, first of all, I give you the gift of prophecy and do it compassionately. Don't do it with pity in your heart. Do it feeling with another person, foretelling and foretelling. Serve and serve gracefully, like you dance, like you move, like it's a, a natural kind of movement. Teach and do it passionately. Encourage and do it liberally. Encourage is the opposite of discourage. When you encourage somebody, you give them the courage to risk doing things that maybe they never thought of doing before. When you discourage somebody, you take part of their heart away. Encourage people and do it generously. Lead and lead diligently. That means persistently. That means always be there. Show mercy and show mercy cheerfully. We think about uh, a lot of times people call on us to do something for us and we see it in interruption in our life. Let me remind you how God works. Many times God interrupts our lives and those interruptions turn out to be divine appointments. So lead and show mercy and do it cheerfully because you may actually see God. Love devotedly and sincerely. There's a commitment and a persistence in this, but also sincerely. Sincerely is a craft word. Potters use it. That means when the uh, pot is fired, when it's fired, if it's not sincere, it will crack under fire. So when it says love sincerely, that means love fully. 
hope joyfully, pray fervently, be hospitable graciously. And then the Bible says, laugh when you can, cry when you have to. Laugh, but laugh with people. Don't laugh at people. Laugh with people. And then cry when you have to. It's perfectly right to mourn with people. Uh, in fact, in the Bible times, the whole village is mourned together. And then after all this, he says the twelfth thing I want you to remember is live this life, this abundant life, this everlasting life that starts today and goes on forever. Live it peaceably. The word in Hebrew is shalom. And remember again, in John 14, Jesus says, My peace I give you, not like the world gives you. It's not just an absence of conflict. It's the presence of His presence is peace. Now let me remind you in closing the questions. What do you want for your life? What are you really looking for in your life? And what is the deepest hunger in your heart? That's what this whole passage is about. And I hope that even though you may forget these words, you will not forget the questions. Can we have a prayer before we leave? God, we are convicted by Your Word. We are convinced by Your love. And we are committed by Your way. What else can You do but what You have already done? For it's in Jesus' name we pray and live. Amen. Let me tell you a little song that I learned when I was when I lied to get into Bible camp when I was in the second grade. I told him I memorized 300 Bible verses and I've been trying to memorize that ever since. Here's the song. After all He's done for me, after all He's done for me, how can I do less than give Him my best and live for Him completely after all He's done for me? You can have that song if you want to. Thank you for being with me today and you'll have a better teacher next week. Thanks so much.